big things that you see in Viking TV shows, and especially in this scene in Vikings, is Vikings putting on makeup, particularly putting on eyeliner or eyeshadow. But there's a lot of debate about whether we actually have any real evidence for people in the Viking Age wearing makeup, specifically whether we have Norsemen wearing makeup. We have evidence from other places of cosmetics being used, especially in places like Italy and Spain, where we know that things were being applied to faces to make people look different, which is basically the definition of makeup, right? But were the Vikings actually wearing makeup? And in particular, were Viking men wearing makeup? Oh, I get it. Trying to tell us we can't wear our war paint now, are we, soy boy? Are there no depths to which you will not sink? I'm not here to stop you wearing your makeup. You can wear whatever you like. It's not makeup. It's war paint. I mean, it's definitely not war paint, is it? That's one thing that we definitely don't really have evidence for, is Viking men putting on lots of war paint to go into battle. It's war paint. Just call it makeup. Don't be self-conscious about it. Just own it. You be you. Yeah, whatever. Okay, anyway, just bear with me. We do have written evidence from the Viking Age that people in Northern Europe were wearing eye makeup. Ha! But there are some problems with it. So if you were to Google, for example, Viking makeup Heatherby, you would probably immediately uh, get some articles on Abraham Ben Jacob or Abraham Ibn Jacob, and his full name, uh, I believe, is something along the lines of Ibrahim Ibn Jacob al Turtushi, I think. So Abraham Ben Jacob is a 10th century Hispano-Arabic Jewish traveller, basically, backpacker, if you like, and we say he was Jewish, we don't know if he just came from a Jewish family, we don't know if he was practicing Jewish. His name and some other surrounding elements suggest that he was from a Jewish background, but we don't know if he was practicing or not. He, whatever, he probably wasn't eating bacon sandwiches for breakfast. So Abraham ben Jacob goes on this amazing voyage. He goes on this huge grand tour, if you like, in 961 to 962. In February, he has an audience with the Holy Roman Emperor, with Otto I. He goes to Poland. He goes all over the place, basically. And one place he goes to is a town, which is currently in Schleswig-Holstein, but back then was in Denmark, southern Denmark, a town called Hedeby. I know it's a thing where... Hedeby is, is it in Denmark, is it in Germany? It's been in all sorts of places, depending on which century we're in. I mean, the whole Schleswig question is one of the reasons why there's a unified Germany in the first place, for heaven's sake. I mean, they actually... So, Ibrahim, or Abraham, is from Tortosa, which is in, I think, Calabria, in Spain. And he goes all the way from Spain, all the way to the north, all the way to... Northern Germany slash Southern Denmark. And he goes to Hedeby, where he sees Norsemen and women wumbling around their daily business, their day-to-day -day lives. One of the things he says is that they worship Sirius. Now, Sirius, obviously, is a star in the night sky, and they weren't just there being like, Yes, lad! You go! Look at him! That big fiery gas ball! They weren't doing that. Saying that they worship Sirius is basically shorthand in Islamic texts for saying they were pagans. They weren't worshipping an Abrahamic religion. They weren't Jewish, Christian, or Muslims. So that is shorthand, okay, for saying they're not like us. One of the other things he specifically says is, on them is coal, upon them is worn coal, and if they colour their eyes with it, it never vanishes, and their beauty increases among both men and women. So, we've got this indelible, around the eyes, or in the eyes even, coal, not C-O-A-L, K-O-H-L. Now, coal is actually quite a complex cosmetic. 
It involves things like stibnite and antimony and sometimes lead and gum resins and all sorts of other amazing stuff that you really want next to your eyeballs on a regular basis. Don't do it. Coal is, I'm aware of this, currently used by a lot of uh, Muslims as it is part of the Prophet Muhammad, Allah bless his name's direction to you in the Holy uh, Quran. I get that. Use a modern version if you can, because using lead, antimony, and other things can be really bad for your health. So if you can, I don't think it's haram to use modern coal instead of the ancient stuff. I'm really, really sorry if it is in any branch of Islam that you practice, but pretty sure you can use non-lead contaminated coal as part of your... As part of your religious practice. Please be able to use non-lead contaminated coal as part of your religious practice. Anywho, that wording is very, very clear. It's very, very clear. I've got it up here on my laptop that I've been using to do research. That I've been using to do research. Like, what would I have been using to research instead? A wax tablet and a stylus. I mean, I am from North Wales. I did literally learn to write on a piece of slate when I was four, so... Wow. This is where the Patreon money goes, is buying me new pieces of slate so that I can write <laughs> my research down. Join my Patreon because I'm a poor little Welsh urchin. So, it's very specific. On them is fabricated coal. If they colour their eyes with it, which never vanishes, and beauty increases among men and women. This is a thing. Islamic people were aware of it. Jewish people were aware of it because it is mentioned in the Jewish Bible uh, in a couple of places. Um, where I think Jezebel enlarges her eyes with coal and it would have been a thing that he knew about, obviously, uh, being from uh, Al-Andalus. So the fact that he mentions it on his travel up to Heatherby is really interesting. So there we go, right? That's it. That is definitive evidence that in 961, AD 961, Vikings were wearing eye makeup. Right? Wrong. Oh. Because this text, even when people say this is the original text, this is the original, is not the original text. And there's a real good reason for that. We've lost his book. It doesn't exist. If anybody finds it in a library somewhere, then you will have found one of the great lost works of... Al-Andalusian Islamic literature. This is a, a lost tome. The earliest fragment that we have of this work, as far as I'm aware, is from 1068. And that was written by a man whose name I've forgotten. So that was written by a man whose name was Abu Ubaid Abd Allah ibn Abd Al-Aziz ibn Muhammad ibn Ayyub ibn Amr al-Bakri. Or al-Bakri as he is often known. So, he is another Andalusian, uh, Arab Andalusian writer. He is a historian, he's a geographer, he writes about the city of Ghana, he writes about the west coast of Africa, he writes about the expansion of Islam south into more of Africa, he writes about Spain, he writes about Europe, and one of his most famous books is called Kitab al-Masalik wa al-Mamalik. Yes. I'm really struggling with Arabic. I have not a word of Arabic, and I apologise for butchering all of this. The Book of Highways and of Kingdoms. So his Book of Roads and Kingdoms, basically, describes all of these kingdoms and how to get to places all over Europe. Most of them were places he'd never been. Um, but he... I mean, he spent his entire life in Cordoba, I think. Or Seville. Seville. Most of his life he spent in Seville. Um, he never, ever went to any of the places he'd visited, ever. This is all second-hand. And he uses some of uh, Ibrahim um, ben Jacob's book to describe Hedeby. So he uses this book from a hundred years previously to describe Hedeby. Now, when al-Bakri was writing, it's likely that there were copies of the book available. You know, a hundred years later, yeah, if he's in the great library at Cordoba, he, or Seville, he probably has access to this book in one of the big libraries that they have down there. So it is likely that this is an accurate quote. Much of what he writes is pretty good. 
A lot of what he writes is based on literature, but it's a really important source of information. His Book of Highways and of Kingdoms is a big, important Islamic text that we can use to learn about early medieval Europe. It is good. A lot of the info in it is pretty good. But not all of it. Some of it is, like I said, second hand, some of it is third hand, some of it's based off pretty dodgy accounts from merchants, some of it's quite biased against non-Islamic people. This is what we have. It's pretty objective, most of it is pretty good. Also have fragments of it in Zakaria al Kazwimi's work, uh, whose name was, and I forgot his entire name, I do apologise, they're long names, uh, Abu Yahya Zakaria ibn Muhammad al Kazwimi, or al Kazwimi, who is a 13th century Persian physician who also uses some of Ibrahim ben Yaqob's book. So we've got a book from 100 years after, almost exactly 100 years after um, ben Yaqob goes to Hedeby. And we don't know anything about what happened to him after that, by the way. We've no idea if he even got back to Spain. We haven't got a clue what happened to him. There's, there's nothing. There's no report of his journey back. Nothing at all. We don't even know when he died. Don't really know when he was born. And then we've got a book from around 300 years after this journey, telling us that Norse went, Norsemen and women were wearing coal. So was it coal? Could they make coal in southern Denmark at this stage? I mean, yeah, probably. Stibnite occurs naturally in some parts of Germany and France. If they couldn't get access to it naturally, they could get it imported. We know that people were going from Spain to Denmark. I mean, Abraham Ben Jacob did it, so why couldn't some bits of rock and makeup and cosmetics and stuff go there? You know, we have earthenware and we have bowls from the 10th century coming from Central Asia. So cosmetics and various other luxury goods coming from Spain isn't a particularly great leap of faith to make. Do we have evidence that was happening? Not yet. Could it be anything else? Absolutely. It could be charcoal. They could simply be using charcoal, right? Except that it is described as permanent. It doesn't fade. So it's probably not charcoal, because if there's one thing charcoal's really good at, it's fading and staining. Could it be something else? Could this be something different? What does he actually say in this quote? He says, they colour their eyes with it. Now, coal, obviously, you use it around your eyes. You enlarge your eyes with it. Could it be something different, though? Could it be, for example, henbane? So we know henbane was being used in this period. We found uh, a woman's grave in Denmark. I think it's in Firkat, or Firkot, uh, that contains a purse of henbane seeds. So henbane is also known as belladonna, because in the late medieval and early modern period, Italian women would actually drop it into their eyes to dilate their pupils. So if you, vroom, your pupils go boom, kapawi, hazuf, like Garfield when he sees lasagna. <laughs> so is that something they could have been using? Well, yeah, we know that they were using henbane. As far as we can tell, they were probably using it to get real high, because if you throw henbane seeds on a fire, it makes you see really cool stuff. Don't try this at home, obviously. We think that part of their mysticism, uh, Norse mysticism, may have involved throwing henbane seeds on a fire uh, that a seeress may have then inhaled to see weird stuff, to see the gods, much like we think the Delphic Oracle was doing in ancient Greece. So maybe some kind of Viking mystery cult that we don't know about, which I think is so cool. Um, don't do drugs. Were they using henbane? Maybe. Were they using coal around their eyes? Maybe. Is this a reliable description of Viking Age makeup? Maybe. We don't know. I mean, we don't have any primary sources for it. This is not a primary source. However much people claim it is, it's not. We have a 100 year later quote. Alright? 
This is this is a quote in somebody else's book from a hundred years later. Yeah, this is a tertiary source. It's not a primary source. So we cannot hold it up as 100% reliable evidence that Norsemen were wearing makeup. I like to think that they were importing cosmetics from Al-Andalus, that these Islamic merchants were loading cosmetics up. They were loading their antimony coal, they were loading up uh, a variety of other colorants and cosmetics and makeup, taking it up to Hedeby, and everybody thought it was amazing. And bear in mind that many of these Muslim men may have been wearing it themselves. So coal is worn by men in Islam. So these Norsemen and Norse women may have seen these Islamic traders and gone, that looks really cool, what you've got around your eyes there. That's really smart. You got any of that for sale? And they'd have been like, why yes. Yes, I have. So, I mean, I like it as an idea. The fact that the earliest evidence we have of this quote is from the 11th century, I mean, yeah, that sucks. It would be lovely if we had the actual original text from Ben Jacob. That would be fantastic. But we don't. We don't have that. All we have is a fragment from 100 years afterwards. So, did the Vikings really wear makeup? My gut says yes. My evidence says maybe. And until my evidence says yes, absolutely, I'm not going to be wearing coal at Viking reenactment events. I'm just not, because this isn't... This isn't irrefutable primary evidence that I can extrapolate from. Um, so, until I get that, I'm not necessarily going to be wearing coal to reenactment events. If it's an SCA event, I might do, because, you know, their historical accuracy and authenticity regulations, they don't have any of those things. So I might be, <laughs> I might be getting makeup for, for the SCA events that I do, but uh, we'll see. See if I survive my charity 5k. I'll link in the description if you'd like to donate, by the way. So, um, that is my conclusion. It's a little bit of a damp squib of a conclusion this time, but when isn't it with my videos, right? I mean, you guys don't... You guys don't subscribe to me for my... <laughs> non-stop... Absolutely explosive conclusions in my videos. No, you subscribe so that you can see me fall over. I'm making ass of myself. So, there you go. We have some evidence that Norsemen were wearing makeup around their eyes. Um, thank you to all of the wonderful people who've been sending me gifts. Thank you especially, thank you to Martin. Look at this! I've got my own Bayer tapestry up here. Look at this guy! Isn't that cool? Martin from Tasmania made me that. Thank you, Martin, so much. This is amazing. I love it. It's actually inspired me to do another video that I've been uh, putting off for a while. To do with to do with the Bayer tapestry, to do with this bit of the tapestry that you've made for me. So see if you can guess what. Um, so yeah, look at all these wonderful cards. I've been getting gifts. This card has seeds in it, um, some of which I've planted in the back garden. So thank you guys so much for sending things to my PO box. Uh, it's in the description. If any of you guys want to send me any any letters or cards or anything, I can't promise I'll respond to all of them. But if you uh, if you send me stuff, I will very very proudly display it and try and get as much of it in the videos as I can, because this is so cool! I have people sending me stuff. Thank you to my generous patrons as ever. Thank you to my wonderful coffee donators. Donators? Donors. Uh, you guys have all helped me to start saving up towards a new project that I'm going to be making videos about. Uh, I have been saving up to make a gambeson. So I'm going to be making a 13th century gambeson uh, as accurately as I can. And I'm saving up for the materials and the time that it's going to take to make that. And we're going to do a, probably, possibly a series of videos, maybe just one, of how to make a medieval gambeson and what evidence we actually have for them. So keep your eyes peeled for that if you're interested in that. There is going to be more war gear and armour and stuff. Next week, live stream. So Monday the... I can do mental math. 26th. Double checks on laptop, just to be sure. Monday the 26th of April 2021, I will be doing a live stream. I will put the time up on the community tab. I'm trying to make it a good time for people in America, Europe, Australia. So it's... It's difficult to balance.
comments when people watch my videos from all over the world, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try, be trying to do that. Uh, I'm possibly going to be starting a um, a few streams on Twitch to do some Viking-based games. A few people have asked if I'd be willing to do that, and I'd be willing to do that. So I may do a Twitch stream of me playing things like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Valheim. Um, there are a couple more that people wanted me to to try playing, so so thank you for all those recommendations for Viking-based games. So yeah, um, I think that's basically me. I'm just waffling now, but uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Phrase of the week! How could I forget the phrase of the week? I'm so sorry. So, today's phrase of the week <laughs> is... Um, it's not really related to eye makeup or anything like that. Today's phrase is a wonderful one that means going over the top. And this is actually a phrase that involves a word that we have in medieval Welsh. So um, this word is llestri. If you want to make the sh sound, put the tongue to the roof of your mouth and then breathe out either side of it. Yeah? Sh sh you don't need spit, just sh So the tongue behind your teeth, top teeth. And now you can say San something, which means the parish of somewhere, which is the most common start of a place name in Wales. San Gaffo, San Nunghenedal, San Vaidbechan, places like that. Anyway, Sestri means dishes. It means dishes. Do the dishes. Sestri, um, crockery. So, our phrase is Dros Ben Sestri. Dros Ben Sestri. So, dross, over, ben, pen, head, or top, sestri, crockery. So, over the top of the crockery. Literally, over the top. O-T-T. -T. You've gone over the top there. Dross, ben, sestri. I love it. It's such a great phrase. If somebody's, you know, going dross, ben, sestri, they're going a little over the top there. That's a little too much. I love it. It's such a good phrase. And it's just as applicable and common as OTT or over the top in English. So, dros ben sestri. So, forgive me for going dros ben sestri uh, with the phrase and my excitement for the phrase of the week this week. Uh, a couple of people have asked me if I would be willing to do a separate channel to teach Welsh. Let me know if you think that would be a, f a fun thing and if, if you would consider joining and sharing that. I'm not sure if I've got the time to do that right now, but I might do like a short series or something. I'm also not an expert. I'm not a Welsh teacher, but, you know, yeah. maybe that is Drospentestri. Who knows? There we go, guys. Makeup, evidence for makeup. That is all the evidence we have, by the way, for Vikings wearing makeup. There are no other sources. Nada. Zip. Uh, so there we go. Diolch mawr unwaith eto am y minoth. Thank you so much once again for joining. Uh, it's lovely, lovely, lovely to see so many people joining and so many comments. Nearly 20,000 subscribers. Tanus renesa. Till next time. Hu will amatro. Bye for now. I don't have a sting for this video. I'm, I'm just sat here enjoying the birds. War paint, war paint, you don't need war paint. Mm. Mm. So Viking.